Today we'll be talking about signs of 1970s stagflation and how currently in the US it looks like that's kind of the period that we are uh, going towards. Um, full disclosure, there is a lot of topic to go over today and this will be a very length, uh, lengthy video. Apologies in, in advance. These are the topics we'll be going over today. Uh, disclaimer, I am not a licensed professional investment advisor. These are only my personal opinions only. Uh, please do your own research and contact your own investment advisor uh, for your own investment strategies. Thank you. Due to the amount of content and the length of this video, I've created an executive summary. I think this is something I'll do going forward. So for the next 10 years in US, I expect stocks and bonds to underperform commodities and some productive assets, maybe like farmland, as um, I'll cover later on in terms of yields expected to continue rising, but uh, in, in nominal yields until uh, Fed comes in and caps nominal yield, then I think maybe the stocks and bonds still have um, a little bit of rally left. Um, and, but while uh, inflation and also a lot of the shutdowns have um, restricted supply of commodities, so therefore I think once uh, with inflation, commodities and other productive assets will outperform uh, in the next 10 years when it comes to stock and bonds in the U.S., the Fed will let inflation run hot um, until it gets completely out of control. Um, this because they have to uh, go help the U.S. government go through this deleveraging process. There's also like there's no way of U.S. government being able to repay uh, the the debt it has in today's dollar with tax revenue because it's not politically expedient. So therefore, they will do it through inflation. Uh, but then once inflation gets out of control then the Fed will use the banking regulations um, and rate hikes to slow down velocity. Initially, it will, will probably have some struggles because I expect um, the bond market to become a more control economy, not so much a market economy. And therefore, um, in order to control inflation, it won't be uh, just simply with rate hikes, but rather uh, controlling the flow, which is velocity, um, through uh, the banking system <clears throat> but if it does turn into more of a market economy then a rate hike will be more effective then eventually it will they will be able to stop inflation and to save the dollar hopefully or uh, the dollar just go completely worthless like um, you know the Zimbabwe uh, currency or Venezuela or Weimar Republic <clears throat> but once they uh, cut inflation and no more money printing, then they'll cause the greater depression because then assets will be much more, financial assets will be much more overvalued and also uh, we do have so much more debt now uh, nowadays comparing to you know the Great Depression uh, during 1930s. <clears throat> So policymakers in U.S. will continue massive spending. This obviously still include EU because they kind of have the same mentality. Um, so same with the ECB uh, in terms of the easing policies and you know more QE. Um, they will also push for more free money. So like all these stimulus checks will become more permanent because it's a consumer-based economy. So with people not working, you have to make sure they still have money to spend to keep this bubble going <clears throat> so things like ubi will probably come out um, they will push for higher tax rates because they 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 need to say like oh you know we need more tax revenue uh, but don't worry we'll make sure we give you know middle class and lo lower class you guys your 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 you know ubi checks uh, but we'll tax the rich for it <clears throat> so higher corporate taxes higher um, you know, capital gain taxes, stuff like that. Even though, um, historically speaking, uh, the U.S. revenue as percentage of GDP, regardless of tax rate, hovers around 18%. So because as higher taxes go, more people find ways to shelter their taxes. So really, it's really just 
uh, symbol, not really for effect. Um, they'll introduce things like price control policies that will lead to shortages, like rent controls. <clears throat> and China, once it's done, it's deleveraging uh, process will become the next outperforming market in the decade, uh, like US did in the decade starting 2010, and EU uh, the decade before. Areas of safety, commodities, I think that's a big one. Um, productive assets like farmland, assuming uh, rental properties, uh, if there's it, for rental properties, assuming there's no rent control, so but that one's really difficult. Commodities, I also, um, I also want to make a point that commodities equities also count as part of it. Uh, possibly real estates, but they have seen a very uh, significant rally recently. But it really depends on how much more easing the government and central bank is willing to do. Possibly like uh, more e easier. Uh, immigration policies and uh, continue uh, lower interest rates, uh, easier lending standards for mortgages, and um, you know uh, maybe less down payment stuff like that. And finally, uh, foreign emerging markets. Again, once they're done deleveraging, like China, I think China would be a great uh, investing you know uh, outlook going forward. <clears throat> Again, once it's done deleveraging, so maybe 2022, 2023, really depends how that process goes. Um, Turkey has already uh, begun its deleveraging process. Brazil also just recently started because in order to uh, slow down inflation to uh, save their currency. And that's why you see their assets, financial assets won't perform as well. So it really depends uh, on how that process go, but I think uh, those are the areas of safety. And again, all of these will be discussed more detail uh, into the rest of the video. If you're interested, please feel free to continue watching. Otherwise, thank you for your time. First off, let's take a look at the US Treasury yield signal. So the long end continue to rally quicker than the short end. So the 10 to 30 year, um, yields on the US Treasuries are already um, continue to make multi-year highs. Um, on the right here, that's the spread between the 10-year and the 2-year, and you can see that's continuously um, going further apart. So, And it's starting to pull the midterm, which is 2 to 5-year um, Treasuries, high, much higher. And But it's not impacting the short end just yet. Um, the short end actually decreased and it's struggling to not go negative. I think, again, that's my uh, expectation from the Fed where um, it will have trouble for the short end to not make it go negative while the long end to uh, not keep it uh, continue to rally higher. And the last time we saw this was during the 1970s, which is kind of what sparked this whole um, idea of me trying to create this comparison for this video. But what does this mean? So implication wise, it's the loss of the confidence and value of currency in the long run. However, not trusting um, the economic um, environment in the short run. So people are holding on to short term treasuries because, you know, there's a lot of uncertainties, probably because, you know, it looks like uh, in Europe, the variants of COVID have already caused them to um, go back, like Italy is, I think, is back into a lockdown again. Um, in Canada, I think Ontario is pushing for it. And so it's uncertainty in the short run. And also, if we look at um, equities, very, very overvalued um, because earnings are not expected to continue to improve. And also, there's the higher corporate taxes being um, discussed. So the PE ratios will continue to go much higher, I expect, <laughs> unless the cor correction in equity prices occurs. And investors for the long run are demanding higher returns uh, to compensate their risk of currency devaluation. And the higher yields will continue to impact financial assets uh, valuation. 
where again I talked about this if assuming cash flows are constant the higher your discount rate is which is in this case interest rates uh, the lower your present value of future cash flow would be and that's pretty much what stock prices are or should be and finally so debt crisis is already here and it's getting worse where um, people are unwilling to lend at uh, what rates were so they demand higher rates but you know there's too much there's so much debt that uh, they're expecting you know to to have higher rates to compensate the risk that they're taking on to have um, this debt to lend that money and eventually I think it will start to lead to some credit crisis um, possibly you know in the second half of this year maybe Q, uh, late Q3 and Q, early Q4 and uh, not only does this re uh, lead to you know downgrading on bonds and that is going to have a huge impact on bond prices but also the question of can these companies um, who are those with variable rates can they continue to pay these higher rates and those who have fixed rate but they have to refinance can they also pay that higher rate so again uh, I think this is really going to ramp up and you know spark a lot of the problems in the financial markets next up let's talk about the equity market optimism so there's the famous story by Joe Kennedy um, in the summer of 1929 right before the uh, stock market crash uh, where the shoe shine boy story where um, the the summary of it is that he was just getting his shoes shined and the, the boy who was doing the job was talking to him about stocks and his idea was that you know when the shoe shine boy is talking to you about stocks it's time to sell and and nowadays that's kind of what we see there's a lot of non-professionals who's talking about the stock market and like these retail investors talking about how they have been very successful um, especially beating the professionals um, at the you know like the in institutional investors and and returns a lot of them are taking on a lot of leverage uh, buying in you know the options market buying to very high uh, highly leveraged or highly speculative markets like um, the ARC fund so Kathy Woods um, going after the very high um, tech very risky uh, businesses momentum traded stocks uh, there's also the meme stocks like GameStop or AMC these where the business model is very severely damaged from the pandemic and their expectation of their ability to return to the service and the business level that they once had is very much in question <clears throat> and finally like the latest one we have something called a FOMO ETF <laughs> uh, FOMO for if you're missing out but what this ETF targets is it targets the SPAC deals other high momentum stocks like this this is just crazy and everyone is just short-term focus uh, the idea of get rich fast no one's really investing really they're not investing for the long term for the fundamentals but rather they're just buying uh, to uh, get rich fast you hear these people going like oh why why bother going to work I can make uh, that amount of money in like a day I can make like you know five thousand dollar in an hour stuff like that <clears throat> And a lot of these ads and social media influencers are sharing their story, their stock picks, strategies, or all these uh, zero commission trading platforms. And fundamentals are just no longer being uh, considered. No one, again, no one is looking at the business, looking at their cash flow. Let's say, okay, each year um, or for the next five years, I expect their cash flow to be this. And if I discount it to today's value, I think uh, the market cap should be, you know, 10 billion. If it's trading at eight, then, um, then you know it's undervalued. No one's looking at valuation at all. 
um, in, in terms of fundamentals. Everyone is just buying, you know, because stocks are going up. <clears throat> and a lot of these retail investors, like the, a lot of the recent ones are, are very quite young, like millennials and uh, Gen X, I believe. Um, they, and they have not experienced a long-term bear market in the stock market where, you know, let's say 80% of the time it's a bear market, 10% bull and 10% consolidating. None of them have experienced it. If we look back to, you know, uh, 2000, 2000, they're probably too young, 2008, you know, yes, the market went down quite quickly but it was able to recover within three years and from 2011, uh, 2011 on with the help of QE, uh, the financial bubble was able to be uh, inflated again. And so it didn't really take that long. We still haven't seen that, like recently, we still haven't seen the long term over 10 years, you know, bear market kind of uh, environment. So a lot of these investors, I feel, are way too optimistic and they're not looking at risk at all. We just had the latest FOMC uh, meeting and the press conference uh, quite immediately after. So Powell from the press conference uh, stressed that inflation is not a concern. And there was a question where, is there a benchmark CPI uh, print that would cause the Fed to come out to indicate any rate hikes and he said no there's no such thing we just have to you know analyze as it goes and if there is any inflation it will be transitory meaning it's just you know temporary um, as economy pick up but then it'll slowly return uh, to normal quickly uh, they're also letting the slr uh, the supplement uh, leverage ratio, which is the ability for banks to hold treasury as their reserve at the Fed. They're letting that exemption expire. So we'll see by, uh, by the end of March, we should expect yields to continue rising unless uh, the Fed comes in with you know, more QE, meaning expansion of their balance sheet to buy up those uh, treasuries. And uh, Fed also, uh, Powell also mentioned that there was no uh, inflation uh, after Q, from QE uh, after 2008. And next, uh, seven members now are anticipating a rate hike um, in 2023. And I think last from last meeting from December, there was about, um, I think it was five. And so there's more uh, FOMC members, uh, voters are anticipating a rate hike by 2023. So, you know, no change until then. And another thing is uh, the Philadelphia Manufacturing uh, Fed Price Paid Index. So what this is, is it measures the cost for manufacturing companies. It hit its highest level um, in a month from the high for like 40 years. Uh, the last print of such amount, we have to go back to 1980s, where the CPI was you know 12.5%, um, GDP was negative 0.3%, and unemployment was 72 while the Fed rate was 13%. So such environment, com in comparison, like now CPI, they're not even, uh, it's not even at two yet. GDP. Fed's forecasting to be 6%. Unemployment, I think the latest print we have um, is back down to 6%. And we have Fed funds rate at zero. So, but the manufacturing uh, price index is showing of a 75.9% uh, as the newest print. So what I think is happening is the manufacturers, so these guys are th pretty much the top end of the supply chain and they're slowly, and they're in, they're experiencing massive price um, increases in terms of their input costs. Now the question is, so with their margins being cut, are they going to start passing those um, costs down the supply chain, meaning we'll start seeing an even greater increase in terms of our average day prices? Um, and finally, I think the Fed's narrative is just ignoring different factors where 
now comparing like for example comparing to the great recession in 2008 we have much much greater uh, budget deficits meaning we're relying more on imports um, much higher debt levels not only on a national level but uh, so not only in federal government, but also municipalities, individuals, and corporate. And the Fed balance sheet is also much bigger. Where QE123, it took all the way up to 4.5 trillion, and we've uh, we're sitting at seven uh, trillion right now. And I do expect it to continue going because you know Fed uh, Powell hasn't mentioned the. Uh, QE is stopping yet, so you know we might double from there. And there's also a price increase already here. Like looking at real estate, it's rising much quicker than anyone um, anticipated. And finally, you know, past performance is not an indicative of future performance. Yes, maybe real estate is done, um, you know, going up in price. But the point is, Powell can't say. You know, we did QE back in 2008. It did not cause inflation. Well, the factors aren't the same now. So you can't expect with the environment that we are in now that uh, with all the QE money printing, it would not lead to inflation. And, you know, <laughs> if you actually have been keeping an eye out for your grocery bills, you would see that there has been a big increase. And a lot of it stems from like, you know, higher ga uh, gas price will lead to because we need gas to transport goods and that will add to the cost. And also there is, again, the supply uh, chain restraint um, from you know, imports from China being more expensive, container crisis. So the factors are indicating inflation, but Powell's and the Fed's narrative is there is no inflation. And they're trying to cover that up as much as possible because if that got out, because the fact is that they can't, they won't be stopping it. They have to let it run hot because that's the only way to deleverage and also continue to keep the asset bubble uh, not popping. So that's why they but they can't tell the public that. So that's why they keep denying the fact that there's inflation, even though, you know, it's very obvious. Now let's talk about the 1970s stag inflation uh, comparison. So stagflation is stagnant inflation. So, and that's also a period where you have higher unemployment accompanied by higher inflation. So nowadays, a lot of people think like you know, with the Laffer curve, um, unemployment and inflation is inversed and also during a downturn you require um, government spending and fall. that's the belief of the Keynesian theory of economics and the 1970s is really the period of time in, in the US that it proved that the Laffer curve is you know a joke <laughs> and Keynesian economics you know is also uh, it doesn't make sense because Keynes had struggled to explain um, this period and what could have caused it. And that's where, you know, figures like Milton Freeman came out and provided an explanation to what really should be done um, in a downturn. Um, and also he, he was able to explain, you know, what really happened. So now let's talk about a few points. So trade deficit, there were, uh, before the 1970s and 60s, um, there were really very few uh, trade deficits in the U.S., but it kind of expanded throughout 1970s into 1980s. Now, obviously, we're just having greater and greater budget deficits or trade de deficits. And what that means is there's higher reliance on import than export. Um, so U.S. is not exporting as much in terms of dollar value as it's importing. And so that means it, it's a downward pressure in terms of the currency, so US dollar, because you're requiring more uh, from the rest of the world than you're providing to them. Unemployment. So unemployment peaked around 8% in 1975 during the 1970s. And right now it's 6.2%. But a key takeaway is um, 
we, we should be looking not at the top line figure, but rather the whole workforce, so including like the discourage um, workers. And that's where I feel you'll see a better reflection um, of the whole economy. And another thing to take into account is um, the hours worked um, from the latest job report and versus the uh, hourly wages. So hours worked has decreased, but average wages have increased. So meaning workers are being uh, less productive, they're not working as many hours, but the wages um, continue to rise. So again, this builds into the stagflation uh, issue because it you know, continuously increase the pressure on prices. Taxes, the top marginal personal rate um, back then was 70% throughout the whole 1970s. Um, right now, obviously, tax rates are much lower, but tax hikes are being proposed. Um, uh, Biden's delivering his promise, but one thing to keep in mind, um, tax revenue and the percentage of GDP doesn't really change regardless of the top marginal rate because um, it's around 18% because as the tax rate gets increased, uh, people find ways to use you know, tax shelters to just avoid um, paying, having to pay these taxes. So really it's more like a symbol, a symbolism than really um, trying to increase um, tax revenue. Uh, federal debt, um, the U.S. federal debt as a uh, percentage of GDP um, almost uh, tripled during the 1970s, um, even though a percentage of GDP is only, you know, it actually decreased from 34% to 32%. Nowadays, um, using the U.S. debt clock, it's surpassing $28 trillion. Keep in mind, this does not include the um, off-balance sheet item, which are, uh, which include the unfunded liabilities, <clears throat> which is estimated to be you know 100 trillion of both federal, state, and uh, municipality uh, pensions, and that's currently sitting at uh, just the 28 trillion is sitting at 130 percent of GDP, meaning um, a whole year um, U.S. have to not spend for you know a whole year. And, and just use all that proceed to pay off the debt and it still would not be enough. Um, price controls, price ceiling, so they're uh, causing a, a price cap below the market value. That's where you have a shortage, where there's more demand than su uh, supply. And back then there was uh, rent controls, um, gas, etc. And that caused um, a shortage in the system. And right now we only have rent control, but I do expect, um, it, well, for for the for the pandemic, I do expect it to um, continue um, maybe later on. But also introducing new price control as um, prices continue to increase. Now let's talk about some foreign tensions. You know, the new Cold War. It's kind of funny that they're having uh, the U U.S. China is having their conference in Alaska, so it's kind of cold there, so new Cold War. <laughs> uh, so U.S. versus China, so uh, where is where's this tension coming from? So U.S. wants to deleverage, but China doesn't want to leverage up um, to help U.S. deleverage, because, okay, come on, like, you, yeah, you want to inflate your debt away, but I don't want to take that on, I don't want to take that loss. So, that's where kind of the tensions coming from, and also China is growing to be, you know, a greater uh, power. It's taking control uh, more from developing countries. They're, China is helping them build infrastructures in exchange of raw materials. It's trying to establish all these uh, different trade deals. Um, and U.S. as still the number one uh, country in the world. They're unwilling to give up its position. So you know, a lot of tensions going on. And during the Alaska conference, we can see that you know, U.S. is accusing China um, on it, its human rights violations. China fired back saying like, hey, look at your own issues. Like you're, you're claiming um, systemic racism, oppression, etc. 
And I actually, the, the reply was actually really good from the US side saying um, that they face their challenges and we learn, we know we're imperfect and we don't, we're, we try to be open about these issues and we're not ignoring them and we try to face them and we get better. So, you know, a lot of tension going on, but it looks like US had, you know, a, a pretty good reply there. Um, and then finally, the talk of boycotting the Winter Olympics in 2020, uh, I think, in China. And so again, this is this kind of goes back like there's history, like boycotting. So between U.S. and Russia, or USSR at the time, I think, um, boycotting uh, the Summer Olympics in 1980 in Moscow, and then Russia boycotting the U.S. Olympics uh, subsequently after. So a lot of tensions between these two big powers, and you know we will continue to see how this plays out. But I think. Uh, U.S. needs China in terms of the all, all the big imports, and China to an extent does not want U.S. to die off like die off so quickly, because China has a lot of uh, like it still needs to establish its credibility to strengthen the the yen, also using the currency swaps agreements between other central banks, and it needs to be able to establish itself much better before uh, you know completely throwing out US and also because China holds a lot of US treasuries obviously they have been decreasing it as a percentage to GDP growth uh, but the you know if US goes bankrupt then you know you take a loss like you know you know 50 cents on, like 30 cents on the dollar kind of thing but if US is to slowly decline instead of just immediately uh, immediate implosion, then you know China will come out better. So let's talk about some forecasts. So market expectations, they're still worried about Fed tapering because they're concerned that uh, Fed will hike rates sooner than expected. But I think uh, they will eventually learn that Fed will not fight inflation because, at least not in the initial phases, where that this is the only way to deleverage, to help the US government deleverage, because US government is not, like at least po politicians, will not try to um, inc use tax revenues to pay off its debt, but rather use inflation because it's more politically expedient. Because uh, imagine, like, you know, hey, vote for me, I'll raise, you know, your taxes and I'll pay off the debt. Like, that's the people doesn't people don't like that people want something for nothing and so continuously promising more programs more government spending and pay that by inflation and i think once the market realize that the fed will not fight inflation maybe we'll see another rally but i think uh, in terms of the historically high valuations i wouldn't bet on it um, I do expect once inflation really gets going, and if we see hyperinflation, then you know we can look to examples like Zimbabwe, where you know in their own dollar, in their own dollar terms, you know ignoring for uh, forex, their stock market performed great. <laughs> um, but again, I wouldn't bet on it because I'll talk about this um, in the later point in the Fed's playbook. So yields, yields continue to rise, and I do think that will be the case in the short term until Fed comes in and cap nominal yields. So YCC, yield curve control, maybe Q3. <clears throat> but eventually they will come in to cap nominal yields because um, that will prick uh, the debt bubble. And, find, and now let's talk about the Fed playbook. They will first let inflation run hot. They'll cap nominal yields. They'll try and in order to help deleverage. But the end game is once inflation gets out of control, and they re like wreak havoc, you know, just everywhere. The only way to stop it, um, they'll probably start by trying to, uh, you know, talk about rate hikes. You know, let uh, the market. Uh, 
acknowledge, uh, acknowledge that, but eventually they will have to hike rates. And at the beginning, I think because the Fed has so severely been involved in the market, so it's not like a market economy anymore, it's more like a control economy. So in order to slow down inflation in a controlled economy, they have to control bank reserves um, through private banks. And then if it does return to a more market economy, then the rate hikes will work. So if we look at 1970s where Paul Volcker had to come in um, and what he did was, you know, the, he hiked rates three times, eventually getting to almost 20%. That's how you know, he stopped inflation. And once the Fed uh, does that, then they'll cause the greater the, the greater uh, depression versus you know 1930s because uh, we have so much more debt, so much more leverage uh, levered up, and because of that, I think that's and that's why I think we will. Um, experience the greater depression once the fed has no choice that they have to cut the tap off they have to uh, hike rates they have to um, you know kill inflation in order to save the dollar and in terms of the next 10 years um, i do expect like inflation to continue to pick up pushing real yields further into in, into the negative and where we can see that in terms of uh, the market anticipation. We can look at the five-year uh, tips rate. It, if it continues to go lower, and but the reason why I say real yields is because I expect Fed to come in to cap nominal yields. So as uh, nominal yields are capped, inflation uh, increases, then real yields are put pushing further negative. Uh, higher nominal yields will continue to impact stock valuation you know, until they get capped um, and bond returns. And I do expect perhaps the next 10 years to have a real uh, long-term bear market. Like, you know, 80% is bear market, maybe 10% bull market, and the rest being consolidation. <clears throat> and I do expect the commodity super cycle to continue where commodities just take off like they did in the 1970s. And other real assets like farmland, other pro product, uh, pro productive um, real assets. I'm not too sure about real, uh, residential rental just because um, I do expect rent control to really continue and also like get implemented uh, more uh, later on. So I don't know about uh, residential rentals. And finally, I don't think it will be um, in terms of um, areas to look into to pre protect yourself. I don't think cryptocurrencies will is the area. Obviously, if you own a lot of it at the beginning, you know, you're doing great already. But because it's a pyramid scheme, that's why, because you need to continue to suck in more buyer to prop up the price <clears throat> and anyone's person's gain is someone else's loss. So again, a pyramid scheme, the early guys make a lot of money, no one else do. And if we look at assets, you have productive assets, um, like income generating. So let's say, you know, a piece of farmland, um, you can have a uh, stock equity where they pay dividends or they stock buyback or uh, bonds. So debt where you get an interest on on top of your principal uh, repayment, or you can have uh, non-income generating assets as commodities like, you know, oil, um, weed, you know, something that you can use. Um, I see cryptocurrencies as just another fiat currency, but what's the difference? Fiat currency, there's an ultimate use where um, and it's demanded by the government because they demand tax dollars to be paid in their decided uh, currency. And if you don't do it, you know, they'll, they'll send the police after you. But cryptocurrencies have no such use. 
yes, you can use it to buy things, you can, um, but as, as a mean of exchange, but it doesn't have an ultimate use. And that's, I think, the biggest difference. And then, uh, again, there's a large amount being controlled by the whales. And I look at, you know, the five minute charts, you can see throughout, you know, regardless of the price action up or down, you can see a big amount of volatility within a short period of time. Um, like, let's say it's going up uh, as uptrend, all of a sudden it'll just, you know, drop um, a big amount and then it'll rally right back up. And then you'll see the volume spike during those times. So these are just the whales coming in, they're dumping up a lot and then they're buying it right back up and they're able to do it because they have such big amount and they just keep rinse and repeat, they keep making money on, on both sides, both the short and long side. And then there, and if you happen to buy up, let's say one currency, uh, like one cr uh, cryptocurrency, one coin, they'll just, you know, they say, okay, you can have that one. I'm going to go on another coin. Like that's, that's why I, I think, you know, it's really just a pyramid scheme. And finally, um, the central bank digital currencies. So if you think about it, central banks like control, governments like control. <clears throat> if they're pushing out um, their own digital currency, do you really think that they will try, they, will, they won't remove their competition in, you know, if uh, cryptocurrencies are seen as, you know, a substitute? Of course they will. And they don't have to outlaw it. They just, you know, they can increase transaction costs, more compliance, uh, or just, you know, higher taxes, just anything. Because they don't like giving up control. Yes, you can say like, oh, but uh, we can just all go on to it. But who is really, is everyone really going to go on to the blockchain to use cryptocurrencies? I I think the technology is great, but don't mistake in the technology with uh, cryptocurrencies because they're completely different things. I think the technology is revolutionary and I think it will continue to make, um, you know, move towards it. And that's why I think the central banks are catching on. They're moving their digital, uh, their fiat currency on to digitally because what happens is they can have more control over their own currency because now instead of the private banks holding it they know they can you know send money uh, to your account much easier they can also take money much easier and they can see where money is but blockchain keeps and like cryptocurrency you keep records of everything that's great but now you can't get it like they can just check it very easily like if you're trying to money laundry or you know you're just trying to hide away from the system kind of thing and there's again there's no ultimate use like it would be for a central bank digital currency to pay taxes and in the game where it's controlled by just whales like players with big amount of coins killing both the short and long end the only way to not get hurt in such a pyramid scheme is to not to participate is not participating. So it's great for speculating. I think it's great in terms of short term uh, speculating return because you know people are making money um, as long as you know more they're able to attract more people uh, to buy in or existing holders to buy more. But again, it's just you know. You're just trading hands between different groups of people. There's no ultimate use. It's not generating any income, but as itself, and it has a high uh, high uh, upkeep cost because of all the data miners that continuously having to mine more new coins and updating the ledger. Really appreciate anyone stuck it out to this point. Uh, last part of the video uh, commodities update so oil we had a big down day um, and 
it was back below on Thursday, uh, below $60 per barrel. It was down 8%. Um, it, it was initially down a, a little bit on Friday as well, but then it shot back up. Now it's, it closed at 61. And because this is because of the demand focus of the market where uh, with the new COVID news coming out, they're really scared um, with the vaccines not being rolled out as quickly as uh, possible. Um, maybe there's going to be more shutdown. Maybe the demand picture will not, you know, it will be delayed uh, to return for much longer. So a lot of it is demand focus, but no one's looking at the supply side. Again, I've talked about this before where U.S. Uh, shell companies who took on massive leverage to stay on ever since Trump pushed for fracking, a lot of them lost money and they are not coming back. And the sentiment on the streets is, you know, no one likes oil. It's dirty energy, Biden pushing for green energy. So no one's willing to lend money to these companies. So oil rigs in US, even though um, oil prices have returned to the $60 level, oil rigs are not increasing. And so again, US will return back to uh, US from a oil exporter to an oil importer and also the need of a stronger dollar. So they can't let oil prices fall. So they're going, and also to slow down China. And so they're gonna to continue to uh, favor OPEC, uh, Russia to keep oil prices, you know, high enough that there's a continuous demand for US dollar. And also the supply does not return as quickly as demand can be because there's a lot more initial investment uh, required to get those oil rigs going and also to turn it back on. It's just not as easy. <clears throat> Gold, it actually held its own uh, with much higher yields now because we saw last week it was around 1.5. Now this week is you know 1.75 for the 10 year. And it's actually holding its own quite well and actually rallied um, up to 17.44 on Friday. So I think the low is in around uh, 1680, and but it, I still need to watch a break of resistance of 7050 to 7060. Once we break that and we don't return uh, to those levels, I think we're we're good to go for the next rally to new all-time high. Uh, similar to silver, obviously. Uh, silver, I don't think it will make a new all-time high yet, but again, it's just a eventually I do expect it to break about 50 but I don't I'm not too sure if this rally is going to be the one but I do think for gold the bottom is in we're just waiting to consolidate a little bit uh, around the level and again once uh, nominal yields get capped once it peaks so once the Fed comes in then I think we're off to the races agriculture so another new idea came out um, obviously, we're still waiting for more news on uh, the harvest uh, this year, uh, for this season actually, for March. <clears throat> but I heard the news that a lot of farmers are expanding their farmland. And in terms of where to invest, I'm, I'm thinking like the fertilizer uh, business, where it's very limited amount, number of big, big players. So they have a lot more pricing uh, ability. And I think as um, you know, weather impact agriculture goods and more farmers are, you know, increasing their farmland. I think the fertilizer businesses uh, could be an interesting area to observe. 